In some cities in China, people are stocking up on food and other necessities. We look at what's driving people to line up at the supermarkets. As many countries question China's official numbers, China is ordering hundreds of thousands of body bags from Taiwan. In Wuhan, a family of deceased got harassed by police after creating a group chat on Chinese social media. A Hubei resident is stuck in a dire situation after coming to Wuhan. His wife told us how in just one night, things took a turn for the worse. In the U.S., New York sees the highest increase of virus death in a day. The virus has claimed more lives in the state than 9-11. Welcome to China In Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. The Chinese regime announcing three minutes of silence tomorrow to remember those who perished during the outbreak. But many online aren't convinced. One pointing out the regime is still hiding the true numbers and asking how it can mourn in good conscience. Another sharp netizen noticed the event's date is April 4 or 404. He says it's the same number he sees when the regime deletes web pages about the virus. China is ordering large quantities of body bags from Taiwan. That's according to a Taiwanese funeral home director. He's recently received urgent orders of 100 to 200,000 body bags. The last time he saw orders this big was after the South China Sea tsunami. This comes as more and more countries question China's numbers. Taiwanese senior media person Zhang Hongyi found out that some Taiwanese funeral operators are producing an alarming number of body bags for China. U.S. Congressman John Curtis wants to hold foreign officials accountable for concealing information on the CCP virus. The bill also allows foreign officials to be sanctioned for concealing future outbreaks. Nine other co-sponsors are named on the bill. Curtis says there is growing evidence Chinese officials accelerated the spread of the virus by failing to take early action. Sanctions include revoking visas and seizing assets. Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison is urging the WHO and the UN to act against China's wet markets, like the one where the deadly coronavirus is thought to have originated, as they pose great risks to the health and well-being of the rest of the world. But uh, these markets, it's not the first time we've seen uh, these types of viruses come out of these sorts of places. Um, I think this is a big challenge for the world into the future. The World Health Organization and other international organizations, I think this is an area they can spend a bit of time and attention on because we can clearly see the great risks to the health and well-being of the rest of the world. And African swine fever has re-emerged in China, killing 206 piglets. Two cases were found in Gangsu province. A report says the cases come from other provinces. But the report didn't mention the name of the province or how the situation in the other province was. On April 1st, Sichuan recorded one death from the disease. This case also coming from another province, but the other province was not named. Two cases in Sichuan province killing 18 piglets. One city in Henan reported 252 piglets from another province were dead on arrival. A city in Inner Mongolia reported 92 have died from the fever. All the cases were reportedly from other provinces, but no one knows which province. There are no outbreak reports from the so-called other provinces. Reuters did a special report on how Chinese officials downplayed the number of swine fever deaths. The report references China's meat industry to say the disease killed half of China's hog herd. It also compares China's swine fever cover-up with the coronavirus cover-up, saying Beijing's handling of the outbreak has troubling similarities, but with a much higher cost, human life. People in multiple cities in China are stocking up on food and other necessities. And though the regime is trying to stop them from panic buying, it doesn't always work. People are panic buying. In some cities in China, they're emptying store shelves and stocking up on rice, flour and other staples. So many people are rushing to buy food, and they actually push the price higher. The government didn't act fast enough. Mr. Ma is from Urzhou City in Hubei, the province where the CCP virus or coronavirus first started. We've twisted his voice to protect his identity. Similar scenes in other cities and provinces. In our city, many people have stocked up on food in case there's a shortage, but most aren't taking it seriously. 
Mr. Xiang is from Shandong Province. His voice is twisted too. Videos on social media show people buying rice, cooking oil, and other necessities in large amounts. In another video, cars line up down the road, stretching far away from the supermarket. Officials try to assure the public there's enough food in stock, but Ma said they don't trust the regime because it mismanaged the outbreak. So why is China at risk of a food shortage? China can't produce enough grains for itself; it has to import. In 2019, China imported over 150 billion dollars worth of agricultural products, including 89 million tons of soybean, the grain it imports most of. But some countries are limiting their food exports now. The CCP virus pandemic threatens their supplies. In late March, Vietnam stopped signing new deals for rice exports. It's the world's third largest rice exporter. In the current situation, if food imports are shut down, I think there will be a food shortage in China for sure. On Tuesday, the World Trade Organization, UN Food and Agricultural Organization, and World Health Organization put out a warning that if more countries start restricting export, the global market could see shortages and price spikes. And in China, while authorities say publicly there won't be any food shortages, internally they're saying something else. In a leaked document, the city of Linxia instructed local officials, in their own words, to do everything possible to secure the food supply and other necessities. A video circulating online showing family members of the deceased in Wuhan got harassed by a police after creating a group chat on a Chinese social media app. <laughs> A family in Wuhan created a group chat on a Chinese social media app after their father died from the CCP virus. But the police came to the man's house and asked them to visit the police station so they could learn about why they created their group chat. The man who created this group said they already had a call with the police about it. The group chat is legal. We are unhappy with our life, and we just want to help each other. There is no purpose. Really, there is no purpose behind it. People like us, like our family, are really pitiful. He added that before his father died, they repeatedly asked the community for help to send him to the hospital. He could not rest in peace. Videos like these show the government closely monitors people through apps like WeChat. In another video released in early February, a woman was admonished by police for posting information online about the CCP. Virus. The police came to her house and asked her to delete the post or otherwise bear the legal consequences. A netizen said in a tweet, "When they ask for the government's help many times, the government is nowhere to be found. Now the government is appearing as police, offering to help, help to shut the family up." Another netizen said, "This looks exactly like what happened with Li Wenliang and other doctors. The regime doesn't reflect, isn't accountable. When the second wave of the virus hits, there will be more victims like Li Wenliang." A trip seeking hope of life turned into a nightmare overnight. A Hubei resident tells us how things took a drastic turn after they arrived in Wuhan. NTD's Juliet Song reports. Miss Jiang arrived in Wuhan in an ambulance on March 23rd, hoping to get surgery for her half-paralyzed husband. But she says when she stepped into the Hubei General Hospital, her heart sank. The hospital hallways are filled with patients. The beds are really close to each other. We never expected things to be like this in Wuhan. We were so scared watching this. Even though we had face masks, I've seen similar things in the news. But seeing it with my own eyes really scared me. Jiang didn't know if those were virus patients, but the next day they arrived. Her husband tested positive. She thinks he was infected in the hospital. We've given her a pseudonym and distorted her voice to protect her safety. In the middle of a pandemic, you wouldn't want to be in a place like a hospital unless your life was in danger. I wouldn't risk coming here if my husband's situation hadn't deteriorated so quickly. Even the doctor told us it's risky coming to Wuhan. Jiang said she knows another patient also tested positive on the same day. Her cousin met the patient's husband in the emergency waiting room. That man was calling the mayor's hotline, crying. My cousin heard him cry and talked to him. 
A doctor in this hospital tested positive on March 23rd. He used to work in a buffer area between the wards and hallways. A doctor said several patients who were also in the buffer area that day were all put under quarantine. I don't know why. They refused to give more information. Jiang's husband later took several tests. The results came back negative. Although the hospital didn't list him as a confirmed case, they also wouldn't give him surgery. They asked him to go to another hospital and into quarantine for 14 days first. Jiang said many hospitals won't take her husband. My tears are running dry. I can't cry right now even if I want to. I cry too much. My head aches. An MRI scan shows a small fissure and blood in her husband's brain tumor. Jiang said her husband is panicking. To be honest, I never expected to be in a situation like this after staying one night in Wuhan. I never expected this to happen. Jiang said her husband also regrets coming to Wuhan for treatment, but hospitals back home aren't good enough to perform brain surgery. As the days drag on, her husband still doesn't know if he will survive long enough to have his surgery. Li Xinan and Juliet Song, NTD News, New York. On Friday, Wuhan authorities announced they will ramp up control of residential compounds and urged residents not to leave their homes unless necessary. That's five days before the expected end of the lockdown of the city. White House economic adviser Larry Kudlow dismisses concerns that the small business loan program is not functioning as hoped as the federal government strives to keep businesses afloat. Top White House economic adviser Larry Kudlow said on Friday there will be big demand for the government's small business loan program, but that the banks were prepared. Kudlow dismissed criticism that banks are unable to properly administer the program in the time constraints given. This past week, as the Treasury Secretary put the final touches on, he was in constant touch with the bankers. Constant touch. And don't forget, we raised the lending rate from a half to one percent. Uh, so it's just hard for me to believe. I, I have to look into all these complaints. Kudlow also spoke about the CCP virus pandemic and its effects on the economy. The effects of the pandemic and the mitigation that's required to uh, end it uh, are taking a huge toll. We are in a contractionary point. Um, we have not seen the worst of it. I don't want to sugarcoat it. And that's why we have created the largest rescue package in history. Over 260,000 people are confirmed to have the CCP virus in the U.S., and nearly 7,000 have died. Kudlow also spoke about President Trump's efforts to get the world's oil supply back on track and help Saudi Arabia and Russia reach a truce so oil prices can stabilize. President Trump believes that they have given uh, agreement and commitments to you know, ending their spat with each other and stop artificially throwing oil on a market which is already vastly oversupplied with oil because of the world collapse of demand from the pandemic. Trump met with U.S. oil producers today and discussed a potential infrastructure deal that could help the domestic oil market. Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin assures Americans they'll get their stimulus checks within two weeks. Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin said Thursday that the first round of stimulus checks would reach bank accounts within two weeks. I am assuring the American public they need the money now. That's for people who submitted tax returns in 2019 or 2018 and are deemed eligible. These people do not need to do anything further. The checks are for up to $1,200 per person and $2,400 per couple. Children under the age of 17 are eligible for $500 as well. But for those making over $75,000, the amount will be less, and likewise for couples who make $150,000 annually. The check amount decreases by $5 for every $100 earned over the threshold. Anyone owing child support payments will not receive any stimulus money. Mnuchin said the IRS would prefer to make direct deposits into bank accounts over sending a check through the mail. But all options are possible. If we don't have your information, you'll have a simple web portal, you'll upload it. If we don't have that, we'll send you checks in the mail. President Trump also announced that paycheck protection loans were launching Friday for businesses with up to 500 employees, including owners who work solo and freelancers. Loans of up to $10 million can be repaid over two years, starting after six months at an annual rate of 1%. Money used to pay workers' salaries can be forgiven. 
President Trump said recommendations may be coming about the use of masks by the public when going out. He said it was unlikely that they would be mandatory, but that they could prove beneficial in slowing the spread of the CCP virus. He said at present, wearing a mask or not is down to personal preference. But I will say this, they can pretty much decide for themselves right now. Dr. Deborah Bricks, part of the White House Coronavirus Task Force, said that even if using a mask, it is still important to observe the guidelines about social distancing and regular hand washing. The president also said he tried the 15-minute virus test that was approved last Friday by the FDA out of curiosity. I did take a uh, test. It just came out. This is from the White House physician. You may have it. Just came out. I just took it this morning. The result came back negative. And New York State sees the highest single increase in the number of virus deaths. Now 3,000 have died. That's more than the 9-11 catastrophe. Governor Cuomo ordered hospitals to share equipment to handle the crisis. Governor Cuomo said Friday there are nearly 15,000 people hospitalized. Close to 4,000 are ICU patients. Although the number of ICU patients has gone down by almost 40 since Thursday. Some hospitals are struggling to get enough equipment, especially ventilators. But there are hospitals in other parts of the state that have ventilators that they're not using. Cuomo is ordering hospitals to give their unused ventilators and other equipment to hospitals treating virus patients. Masks, gowns, and other protective gear is also lacking. New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio is urging New Yorkers to use homemade face covering, posting in a tweet, Please save medical masks for our health care workers and first responders who truly need them. Cuomo said it he's is, surprised our country can't produce these materials ourselves. In New York State, in the United States of America, we can't make these materials and that we are all shopping China to try to get these materials. He urged New York manufacturers to start making them, saying the state will help cover the costs. Along with more equipment, Cuomo hints that we need more beds to handle the pandemic. The Javits Center makeshift hospital was originally supposed to treat people without the virus, but Governor Cuomo now has the president's approval to treat virus patients there too. Melina Weisscup, NTD News, New York. And Cuomo thanked President Trump for quickly approving the Javits Center's transition, despite the federal agencies not being eager to do it. And in the U.S., companies are shifting their business models to help with and survive the pandemic, like distilleries in New York now making hand sanitizer alongside whiskey. NTD's Miguel Moreno has more from Brooklyn. Kings County Distillery has added an item to its list. To help people disinfect during the pandemic, they're selling hand sanitizer. And this minimum $1 bottle sure does smell like whiskey. (laughs) They started at a dollar and people have donated up to $20 a bottle, um, just depending. So we wanted to make it accessible for people um, and, you know, available at all prices, really. Like other businesses across the country, Gabby said many of their workers were laid off due to the pandemic. And the owner, Colin Spolman, said about a third of their business has been outlawed. So making hand sanitizer was a way to keep the company moving, all while responding to the crisis. Keeping the factory going and keeping people employed, that's a piece of it. Um, keeping the business from going under, that's a piece of it. But but I think, you know, more than anything else, it's, it's responding to the crisis. And... Uh, trying to do something positive, inspiring. And they're flying off the shelves faster than the whiskey. Yep, so this order in particular has three hand sanitizers, which is our current limit per customer per order. Gabby said they're costly to make. However, their supportive customers usually donate far more than $1 per bottle. And amid the turmoil, Spolman said most businesses can find a way to help. But there, there are a number of ways in which most businesses can be helpful if they put their mind to it. And I just think um, when we all look back on this moment, um, you know, it'll be great to say we did what we could. Several other distilleries in the U.S. are doing the same in these unprecedented times. Miguel Moreno, NTD News, New York. And the head of U.S. Northern Command says the military is helping the country battle the CCP virus as a wartime operation. He said they are preparing for a worst-case scenario to keep military members safe. 
The head of U.S. Northern Command says the military is preparing for worst-case scenarios in the battle against the CCP virus pandemic. He says some crew members have already been sent to a secure bunker, the nearby Cheyenne Mountain complex, to prevent them from falling ill. It's uh, 1,800 feet below the, the, the surface of uh, granite, uh, and it gives us great protection, not only uh, for what it was originally designed for, but now as we find out, it actually has been very useful for us to isolate a crew there. The general didn't say exactly how many U.S. service members stationed domestically have tested positive for COVID-19, but acknowledged the virus posed a great challenge to military operations. It is a challenging campaign, though, because it is an invisible enemy. U.S. Northern Command was established in 2002. It carries out missions domestically to protect America and support civil authorities. The group is providing support to areas most affected by the CCP virus outbreak where local authorities need help. And moving on, while China's official infection numbers are often cited, the full scope of the regime's cover-up is usually left out. NTD's Miguel Moreno spoke with a media expert who said this can lead people to make light of the virus. Data from John Hopkins University says the U.S. and several other countries have surpassed China's number of COVID-19 cases. And that has made for dramatic headlines, but often some much-needed context about the regime and its underreporting is left out. If we're just looking at official numbers coming out of countries that you know we don't often know if we're going to get the truth from, I think that we're really doing a disservice to the people because it's important to understand the broader picture of the story. This week, Beijing essentially admitted to hiding its number of asymptomatic cases, a number it didn't disclose before. And official Chinese documents obtained by the Epoch Times show gross underreporting of positive cases. Selapak said people need that extra depth. Otherwise, they may not take the virus as seriously as they should when it could be worse than the numbers show. I think a lot of the reason why there's been, you know, some people who have not taken the coronavirus here in the United States as serious as it should be is because of the, some of the underreporting of numbers. There's this sort of assumption that it might not be that dangerous. Selapak said the media will give people whatever official numbers it can get, but it needs to give them the full picture to actually help them understand. Miguel Moreno, NTD News, New York. And a look around the world. Japan's prime minister criticized the WHO for not including Taiwan, even though they are a global organization. And Google has revealed location data of mobile phone users from 131 countries. Google has revealed billions of its users' location data to see if people are obeying lockdown rules. It's most likely the world's largest data dump so far, spanning 131 countries. Google says it's anonymous and open for everybody to access. The data shows Italy and Spain both saw visits to retail stores and recreational areas plunge by 94 percent. The United Kingdom, France and the Philippines had declines of more than 80 percent. The numbers aren't that high in every country, though. In South Korea, the decline was just 19 percent. Japanese Deputy Prime Minister criticized the WHO on Wednesday for excluding Taiwan. He said it's precisely because Taiwan was not included in the WHO that the country became the global leader in fighting the outbreak. He also talked about the WHO's strong connections to China and a petition to rename it to the Chinese Health Organization. Russia's Komi Republic reported 56 cases of the virus. 55 of those cases were related to one hospital. Russia media reported that a single surgeon could have been the source of the infection. The governor of the affected region announced his resignation. An elderly couple, one who lives in Germany and one just over the border in Denmark, are determined to keep their love alive. They're meeting every day for picnics and a chat on either side of the border. Here they are sharing biscuits and a thermos flask of hot water. An ultra-Orthodox town in Israel is now a restricted zone. Security forces are limiting people from coming in and out of the area to protect its residents. Israeli police put up metal barricades and roadblocks on Friday to enforce a lockdown of an ultra-Orthodox Jewish town currently suffering with a disproportionately large outbreak of the coronavirus. Emergency regulations approved by the cabinet late Thursday declared Bnei Barak near Tel Aviv a restricted zone due to its high rate of infections. The new designation gives authorities the power to tighten curbs on public movement. 
Police units wearing surgical masks and gloves moved swiftly early on Friday to cordon off major intersections around the town and enforce the new rules. A police spokesman said the new lockdown measures mean people are now only allowed in or out for medical reasons. Medical experts estimate as many as 38% of B'nai B'raq's 200,000 residents have fallen ill. The Israeli military will begin removing 4,500 residents aged over 80 from the area to place them in isolation for their safety. And in Germany, foodies have come up with an idea to help restaurants survive the crisis, pay now and eat later. NTD's Germany correspondent Christian Watchin has the story. Like in the U.S., in Germany, restaurants, bars and coffee shops are hit especially hard during the CCP virus crisis. Under the shutdown in Germany, they are allowed to offer only takeouts or deliveries. According to a recent survey by a trade group, the average restaurant would go bankrupt if the shutdown continues for more than five weeks. This new initiative wants to do something about it. All the tours were cancelled and we were thinking, what can we do? And uh, since we um, are very well connected with all the restaurants, we thought, well, we can do something for them uh, so that they can survive. Stormer's food tour company in Hamburg was reliant on restaurants. Now, without any business, he and the other co-founders started the non-profit initiative Pay Now, Eat Later. It's simple. You purchase a voucher for your favorite restaurant on their website. After the crisis, you redeem it. And in the meantime, the restaurant has additional funds to pay its bills. But you also get something worthwhile, because uh, when the crisis is gone, as a um, customer, you get your food uh, yeah, for what you pay before. Of course, you also have the donation part in it because you want to make sure that your restaurant survives. Within two weeks, they already raised almost $400,000. And they are expanding rapidly. Their website features over 600 restaurants in over 30 cities. Maybe they'll come to the U.S. too. Reporting by Christian Watchen, NTD News, Berlin. And NATO members are speeding up deliveries of medical supplies to its allies. It comes after countries like Turkey and the Czech Republic began delivering supplies to Italy and Spain. Military support brought in to help contain the pandemic in the form of speeding up medical deliveries. Uh, our airlift capabilities uh, are important uh, in uh, helping, supporting allies. Speaking on Thursday, NATO's chief said the alliance's top commander is assigned to coordinate the support. NATO's foreign ministers spoke about the eight measures in a video conference call, a first for the military alliance. The COVID-19 crisis is impacting the way we work. NATO officials have said they're taking measures across its operations, regularly taking temperatures of its staff. And if you would like to find out more about the Chinese regime's power struggle, we will be premiering Claws of the Red Dragon this Sunday, 9 p.m. here on this channel. The 54-minute dramatization by former White House chief strategist Steve Bannon delves into Chinese telecom giant Huawei's close ties to the Chinese regime and its goal of controlling 5G. It's a lie. We are in an uncomfortable position because we have an extradition treaty with the Americans. I think the entire U.S. government is fed up with China going afoul of international laws. They just arbitrarily sentenced the Canadian to death. There's no telling where this retaliation will end. You need to be straight with me because if I'm going to survive in here, I need the truth. It's a mess, Michael. I'm not sure. This is a crazy accusation by countries who are jealous of our success. Your Honor, Ms. Fung is an extremely wealthy woman. The Crown is asking that her bail be denied. The legal system operates without interference, full stop. Jane, these are serious people, and they know everything about you. Wait some more. Here at China in Focus, we bring you first-hand information from inside China. Don't forget to subscribe for the latest updates.